getting started. Hello and welcome Axosoft users and friends. My name is James and I'm actually a customer success manager here at Axosoft. I'm happy to present another great addition to our webinar series and really greatly appreciate you taking the time out of the day to join us. Uh, this webinar is going to be on one of the most recent features added in Axosoft version 15.3 called the Release Planner. It's actually one of the most popular improvement introduced in order to really reduce time and effort it takes for planning and managing development in Axosoft. I'm joined by a colleague and friend uh, who is actually a Scrum Master and is also on the customer success team. Uh, his name is Jonathan, pictured here, and will be running the content of today's webinar. Uh, in the session today, we'll be monitoring uh, the questions posted on the GoToWebinar client and answering what we can. So really feel free to post any as they come up. Uh, and if we somehow don't get to it or something comes up later specific to your environment, feel free to uh, contact us as always. So Jonathan, go ahead. All right. Thank you so much, James. So hello, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from wherever you might be joining us on the globe here. So as James mentioned, my name is Jonathan. I'm here with the customer success team. And we wanted to uh, present some information about how customers are currently using the release planner how they're adapting that to their processes um, in, in the hopes that it might relate to some of your own processes that you have within your own organization. Um, these are best practices that we try to share um, just to kind of go ahead and try to optimize your own usage of Axosoft. So for today's schedule, uh, agenda, I mean, so I'm going to surround the webinar around a few major ideas. The first one being, of course, the release planner, as we mentioned earlier, but I'm also going to touch on the burn down charts. So, what is a what what is the burn down chart made of? What are some situations that you might run into, and why might they be happening? And how can I use that data to present it to my stakeholders, to my customers, to my team, so I get a better idea of what might be going on? And then, how can I put that into a dashboard that tells a story about how we are doing, either to the customer or to the team internally, so on and so forth. So, the way I'll be arranging, the way I'll be conducting this webinar is around 10 questions that I'll be um, using to preface each section of the webinar. Um, and then I'll be transitioning over to the Axosoft application itself, so to my test environment, to try to demo some of these examples, some of these best practices that we've uh, um, observed. Um, as I answer some of these questions that we've collected so far, I'll also be just touching on other best practices that I've, that I've seen. Um, and I'll just try to sprinkle those where I see. And then as James mentioned, we will be having a question and answer session towards the final 15 minutes of this webinar. We do tr we are aiming to keep the webinar under one hour. Um, so hopefully it'll go even shorter than that, but we'll try to respect your time, of course, as we proceed. So if you are familiar with our lovely YouTube channel, then you may have seen this content and my voice may very much be very familiar to you, either because we might have corresponded over email, we might have watched other videos, but this has introduced, these three videos here have introduced the release planner in terms of what's the functionality, what does it do? And so the what's new video on the left just presented the functionality as was included in 15.3. Uh, the quick start video number six, um, along with its other quick start video, um, brethren, go through an example of how you might use the release planner. And then the release planner webinar touches on, again, the functionality and it presents a couple other examples of how you might use the release planner. So what we wanted to do today, the way we wanted to kick off this webinar is with that functionality in mind, we're assuming that you already have a pretty good idea of what it can do. And if it, if, and if you don't, we'll go ahead and sprinkle some of those um, how-tos in this webinar. And we'll try to answer those questions if you want to post them in the GoToWebinar. But the first one we want to try to tackle is, so as an Agile team, how can we use the release planner? Why would you use the release planner? And when would be a good time to actually use it? So the first question that we want to answer is, so as an Agile team, how can we use the release planner? So if you were part of the Scrum webinar that I had previously this year, this slide might look familiar. And so this touches on the general process that teams follow if they implement Scrum in particular. Um, and if you're doing Agile, then there's perhaps something similar to what you may have adopted within your own organization. But typically what's happening is there's a lot of front end work that goes into product backlog management um, that is managed by your product owner. Um, and just speaking on that end, we did release a blog post today on as a product owner, how can I use Axosoft? 
that might be something that might come in handy, and you can visit that on blog.axosoft.com. Um, but at what point does the release planner become relevant for a team that is implementing agile practices? And that is right around here. So you have a planning meeting, um, depending on the type of iterations that you have. So are you doing sprints? Are you doing you know, quarterly releases? Where does it make the most sense? Within your organization, there's some process that is occurring where you have the person who manages the backlog interfacing with the folks who actually will be responsible for completing the work um, inside of that backlog. So for determining what skill sets are necessary, what resources are necessary, um, basically answering these two major questions. What will get done in this iteration and how will it get done? And so typically these, these are two huge questions. And if um, typically the way folks have been trained, at least in Scrum, to do this is they set aside at least a two hour time box to answer these two questions between the product owner and the Scrum team, and of course the Scrum master. And the product owner would present the product backlog to the development team so that they can evaluate it and figure out, okay, I see that you have um, positioned this as a top priority. Um, based off of what would be required to develop that, it would take this type of resource this much time. Um, and it, because that's such a huge feature, we can only do so many more, um, even though you have outlined other items, you know, two, three, and four that are also important, but your number one, um, this is the reality of your number one priority, right? And so it does, it's a conversation that occurs. So when you are doing this, let me switch over to Axosoft. So I'm gonna hop over to my release planner, which is located here on this tab. And so this would be a way that you can facilitate that release planning meeting. So you can pull up the release planner and the product owner um, can go ahead and first present their product backlog. And so they can do this by um, selecting either the project folder where that makes sense. In this case, I have a product backlog folder selected. This is what my product owner may use to prioritize um, all the feature requests that come in and I've sorted by rank. And so in this case, what you are seeing is a, a sprint that has already been planned. This is sprint three. I've already assigned items out and it's already in progress. We're just looking at this after the fact that it has been planned, but it still gives you an idea of how you can sort the main workspace here, which is what you see on the left, by the rank. So it makes it really easy to just select the items that you want included in this release after you have this conversation and then drag and drop it over to the right. Okay, so based off of that, what is a, a best practice that we have seen is that we have seen teams estimate items before they assign it to the release. And that's the result of that conversation, right? If you're answering the question of what will be done and you an also answer it how it will be done, then you have the makings of an estimate. You have an idea of how long it might take. And so you include that inside of the details of an item. So you just edit the uh, initial estimate field. And then you can go ahead and just drag and drop that item over to this, the release that you're building out. The reason why this is so critical, and at least for Axosoft in particular, is that we use that initial estimate, which carries over to remaining estimate, to build your burndown charts. And so if you don't have any data there, then it becomes difficult for Axosoft to track your progress if there's no data to track in the first place. So I'll be getting to some of those, um, some of those situations that folks encounter um, when the remaining estimate is missing, for example, or when the timing of when they include those estimates might be before or well after the sprint has started. Okay, so I've talked about when you would use the release planner and why you would use it, at least from an agile point of view. The next thing I want to touch on is that we've received questions about the capacity. What does it mean for an individual um, to have you know, a set amount of capacity. What can I do with that um, with respect to some other needs that I have from the team? And so, for example, if you guys have been you know, well-versed in some of the functionality, if you've seen some of my previous videos, then you know that each user has a capacity that you set for them. And based off the number of workdays that you have selected for them, this will calculate their initial, their, their their estimate, their uh, capacity, their individual capacity, there we go, I got the words, um, for this release. The, it does not recognize any, so each release is independent of one another. And so when you set the release capacity for sprint three, it will assume that this resource is only assigned to sprint three. 
Um, this is something that we might look to expand in future iterations. Um, keep in mind, this is the first time that we've released a um, release planner, so we're always looking to improve it, of course. Um, but currently, this is what you can do with it. In terms of what an end user can do, they may not be able to set their own capacities or their own work days, but they are able to determine their vacation days, which also affects their individual capacity. And so they can do this themselves. Um, so let's pretend that I'm Dave Williams. I can navigate to my name in the upper right corner, go to user options. And so if you're an end user and you're watching this webinar and you don't have permission to set your daily capacity or your work days, you do at the very least have the option to set your vacation days. And so Labor Day is coming up, for example, and you may want to clear out the 7th if you don't plan to work on Labor Day in this upcoming September. What this will do is it will remove the 7th from your um, release. So say I'm working in the next couple weeks, it will remove the 7th from the calculations and that'll be factored into your individual capacity um, for this release. Okay, but this, let's go back to the question I positioned earlier. Um, what can I, what happens if I have developers who, um, you know what, I have them in meetings as well. Even though I know they are supposed to have eight hours dedicated to writing code, they don't. They, it's not quite eight hours a day. It's going to be something maybe like six or five uh, because I have them in, maybe I have them in meetings. Maybe I have them doing, you know, perhaps they're helping out in the community by, you know, mentoring, um, you know, college students or interns. There might be events that might be going on over the next couple of weeks, right? Something very um, local. And so what you can do is you can go back to editing that individual's user capacity and you can adjust it for the next two weeks. If you know that, you know, I know that two hours out of the day, my developers will actually be spending that time in meetings or in other activities. So let me go ahead and decrease that from eight to six hours a day. And what this will do is this will update the individual's capacity. So say I had 10 days of work dedicated to the sprint. Um, so rather than multiplying eight times 10, I will multiply six by 10, right? And so I will get a more accurate um, user's capacity based off of that. And so I can go ahead and plan my releases way more accurately. So that's one way you can do it. Another way that I've seen done or another way I've suggested is you can create an item that is dedicated to meeting times. And so you, you treat it just like a future request, right? As an item to be done, um, you expect work logs to be performed on it because you wanna see if what you initially estimated for the work log, uh, for the meeting times matches what actually happened. And so if you look over here on the left, item 162, I just re I created that just before the webinar started and I haven't set any, I didn't set an estimate for it. And so if I edit this item, and I'm just going to say that I project that this release will have five hours of meeting times total. Maybe it might be more for you, it just depends on your environment. And so I can go ahead and use this item to, and so it updates to five hours, and I can maybe assign this to Dave, and so that I can allocate out of, Dave has perhaps, um, I can change this back to eight hours a day. So of the eight hours a day that Dave comes to work, um, for the next two weeks, five out of five of those hours will be dedicated to you know 15 minutes, 15 minute standups that happen throughout the the sprint, right? And so I can go ahead and make sure that that is included in my calculation. So that those those are two ways, um, those are two practices that we've seen. You can either just adjust the user's capacity to get a more accurate reading of the total user's capacity for the release, or you can associate items to it. And so there's advantages to both, um, takebacks to both. If there's one that speaks to you more than the other, then by all means, you can go ahead and take advantage of that. Another thing that we, another question that we get um, is, what do I do when I have not completed an item? So an item, say, in Sprint 2 was left unfinished, and I need to move it over to Sprint 3. And so this is, this is not something I necessarily need the release planner for. I can go ahead and do this just from, uh, let me do this from list view. And I think I have an example here. So I'm going to focus only on, I'm going to change my filter type to only see features. And I want to look at items in Sprint 2. Okay, so I have a lot of items that have been completed. Um, let's just say I recently had a item 32, which was left incomplete. There were two hours of work um, not, uh, not done. And so I want to carry this over to the upcoming Sprint. And so 
how do I do that? Do I just drag and drop that item over to Sprint 3 and then go ahead and start work on it? Or do I duplicate the item and then just move and drag and drop the item over to Sprint 3 and then just make some adjustments? Um, and so the answer to that is it depends. If you don't mind just dragging and dropping the item over to uh, Sprint 3 because perhaps you're just a small operation, it's really not difficult to keep track of where things have been, then perhaps you have no issue going just moving that item into Sprint 3. The drawback though, as maybe some of you have discovered, is that when you do that, the release planner currently only looks at the initial estimate when it's calculating the individual's capacity. So this is something that we might look to expand in future versions of the release planner. But for the time being, this is what it does. Um, and so if I duplicate an item, I can do a couple of things. And so in my case, I've already duplicated item 32 as item 163. And so it has the same, same information, same as before. And what I have done is I have updated the initial estimate from eight hours a day to be two hours, or sorry, eight hours flat to two hours, right? I have mirrored the remaining estimate to match the new initial estimate. And the reason I do this is because when I start planning things out in the release planning meeting, I can have an accurate initial estimate for when I drag and drop those items that carried over from um, a previous sprint. And then a couple other advantages occur. Um, items that don't get completed will remain in that sprint, right? You will have a physical record. So if I leave this item, you will have item 32 is going to stay here. And whether, it, <laughs> I don't know if it's a, uh, I just need it to stay here because I need it to be closed and I just need to identify that, okay, this item was never completed. Um, just so that when I refer back to it, I know where the original came from. And when you duplicate an item, another thing does happen here. And so perhaps this is new to some of the users here, but you have access to related items. And so if you don't know what related items are, related items are just a link between two distinct items. And so this could be a bug and a feature, a feature and a ticket, a defect and a ticket, or a ticket and a ticket and a feature to a feature, right? So there's several different combinations that you can use. And all it does is just creates a link between those two items. And so in my case, because I duplicated item 32 already, I have a link to item 161. And so if I click on 161, I'll be able to see the details of 161 and I can jump back and forth between other items that might be related to it as well. If you don't know where to enable related items, it's available on the details panel. I just docked it to the bottom of my screen just to get more real estate. That is something that perhaps we, we recommend. I prefer it that way because I get to see more. Um, but if you want to enable it, it's available under this funnel symbol in the upper right corner of the details panel under related items. If you don't see the related items option, that may be because it is not enabled. And so if you want to enable it, you can go to the tools menu, go to system options, and you have to have the permissions to access this menu, of course. And I want to go to the details panel section and then enable the related items uh, across whatever details panel you want it to show up on. Okay. So I've talked about when you would use the release planner. I've provided a few use cases, a few uh, best practices that we have seen surrounding how you could use the initial estimates, uh, sorry, the, the individual capacity for each user. Um, some things that we have seen users do for rolling over items, um, unfinished items from a previous sprint over to the current sprint. Um, and the last thing I want to mention on that is when you create a duplicate, the other thing that happens is that, um, you know, the actual duration carries over uh, and you have that link. Um, so it's, there's lots of advantages to duplicating items. Um, the only thing we don't recommend is duplicating duplicates. That's not something we recommend just because it has a multiplier effect on the back end. Um, so do avoid duplicating duplicates if you can. Okay. And so when do you move on from the release planner? So let's, let's go back to the release planner. So I am accessing this release planner, um, you know, after I've planned, but this is just for demonstration, right? Um, I'm just kind of going over some of the functionality, but if you're looking to, you know, you want to keep track of how things are going, the release planner is not the tool that you want to use to, you know, get an idea of, uh, well, when are we projected to ship? Who's doing what? Um, this is just great for planning out how things will go once things get started. But once the moment that the release starts that people have been logging work logs, you want to move over to the dashboard, to the burn down charts, to the standup. 
Um, and so this will represent the next portion of the webinar. So I'm going to start with a burn down chart. So burn down best practices, just some common questions that we've seen that will hopefully assist you um, as you go forward with your releases. And so let's hop back over to my all items tab. And I'm going to jump now to my burn down chart. And let's do sprint three. So you've noticed I've grouped my data. So let me ungroup it really quickly here, just so it looks pretty. So I'll say none. OK, so this is a common message that some teams may get. You may have received this before. Work has been added to this release. Change velocity start date to when the release was added, when work was added to this release. So um, a couple of key things to understand. Um, the burn down chart, the burn down chart is comprised of the remaining estimates of, um, and give me one sec here. There we go. Okay, the, the burn down chart is, is just one bar that sums up the remaining estimates for all the items that are inside your release. Okay, and so in this case, I'm looking at sprint three. I'm looking across, I've organized my data based off of workflow step, but essentially what it's doing is it says there's 218 hours remaining in this release. And if I were to total um, all of these items for the remaining estimate, then this will equal the 218 that I see here. Okay, so that's important to understand that today I have 218 hours, but how is it calculating the velocity? So you'll find that the velocity is very similar to, you know, it harkens back to the days you took algebra or, you know, back in high school or junior high. It's just using a, an algorithm that's very similar to slope. We, we've added a few things to it, of course, um, but you can essentially think of it as a slope of a line. And so a couple things to keep in mind. A burn down chart will only communicate useful data if the burn if the slope is negative. A negative slope is good in that it will burn down to zero. Eventually it will hit the x-axis, right? And so it's only how fast it's traveling will it determine our projected ship date. If I have a slope of zero, or if I have a slope that is positive, then I will get data that does not trend towards zero and will not be able to give me a projected ship date. And so a lot of the messages that you see will just be a result of either you have a positive slope or you have um, a zero slope or you have no data, right? And so in this case, this is pointing to, um, it's telling me that there's a positive slope going on here because I'm not able to calculate a projected ship date. And typically we see this happen when teams add items to the release after it's been planned. And this may, it's often called scope change um, in Scrum. And so some, you know, the powers that be say, this item must get done. It must be done in this release. I don't care what else you have to do to get this done. You know, perhaps you've run into that situation. And so in this example, I've added this item, big item, last minute surprise, and it's a 50 hour item. It must be done. And if I were to group um, my burn down chart as I had it previously sorted, so I'm going to group by item, you'll see that, you know, on this, on the 21st, it looks like things were flatlining because I didn't perform any work logs. But then suddenly there was this huge item, item 159 that was added that was worth 50 hours. So this is a great way of just being able to look, you know, item per item in your burn down chart of what's taking up the most time. So let me go ahead and ungroup here. And so how can I get this burn down chart to communicate useful information again? And so the easiest thing to do is to change the velocity start date. And so I have Sprint 3 selected. So Sprint 3 is a release I will need to select Edit. And then I have this field called Velocity Start Date. And so I added this item yesterday. And so I can go ahead and move the Velocity Start Date to August 24th, which is yesterday, as at least at the time of the webinar. Hit Save. And so now I have um, moved the first data point to August 24th. And now I get an additional... Um, so I have 218 hours. Yeah, and it looks like I added work even still today, but I'm not gonna be too worried about that because I'm gonna log a work log that will help um, get a better velocity for this release. So let's just say I wanna perform a work log on item 159, the really big one. Let's say we all swarm the ticket or the item and we perform eight hours of work. 
And so that will go ahead and rec it'll recalculate the velocity. I now have a, a negative slope, which is great because now that gives me a projected ship date. And so based off of all the work that's done here, I can go ahead and start getting a better idea of how things are going. So as soon as your team starts um, performing work logs again, at the rate that, they're, that they normally do, then that's when you'll start getting some information that makes a lot more sense. So a couple options just, just to review the situation. So if you run into the situation where work has been added, quote unquote, your options are either to, um, the thing we recommend is moving the velocity start date to the day that you added all that work. This will reset the first data point that the burn down chart will use to calculate the velocity. Um, the second option is to leave it alone. Um, because eventually, if your team does keep continuing to work, um, hopefully it's still trending towards zero, and at some point it'll recalibrate and give you a projected ship date. Um, but that's not very useful if you're trying to get data within you know, a couple, or two or three days. And so I always recommend the first one over the second one. But you could wait it out and see what happens if, if that's uh, something that you don't mind. Okay, so the other message that we typically see is this, no work has been done for this release. And we commonly see this when teams have added all these items and they claim, but I did work on this last week. Why was why does it say no work has been done on this? And you know, it's a sad face, right? So and but there's a reason Axosoft believes that no work has been done. And so Axosoft will only update the burn down chart if the work logs have been performed while the items were assigned to this release. So right now I'm looking at you know 204 hours of work and some of these items might have work logs but the work logs were perhaps performed before they were assigned to the release. So say I did work on this last week um, but I only assigned um, item one uh, item 60 to version 1.1 this Monday and so as a result because that work log was not performed while the item was assigned to version 1.1 it won't recognize it as you know any work that has been done. While, while the release was watching it, right? And so all you have to do is just make sure that you perform. This is, it goes back to my first, one of the first best practices that, that I suggested. Always associate um, an initial estimate to an item before you assign it to a release. This will automatically populate the release, um, the remaining estimates. And then when you perform work logs, so many things have already come together. The item has been assigned to the release. It has a remaining estimate and you're performing work logs after you've done both of those things. And so if you do all of that, then you'll never get this message, right? Um, but if if you add work items, or in this case, what I've done is I've added all these items, but I haven't done any work, then I just need to add work logs and that'll start trending towards zero. And then the last one is that there's been no data. So a couple things may happen here where you may have added items to a release and you have perhaps a whole grid view of items and you see that there's no data. Well, that might be because you have no remaining estimate for all of the items. So even though you have like 120 items included, all of the remaining estimates for every single one of those items is zero. And so because the burn down chart only uses remaining estimate to calculate um, your velocity and to display data, there's nothing to display. And so always the first best practice I suggested earlier will take care of this immediately. If you assign in an item, an initial estimate before you assign it to a release, that will auto populate the remaining estimate and you'll you won't have to worry about getting this message. But if you do encounter it, that is what happens there. Okay, so I've touched on some of the major situations that folks encounter um, when they assign items to a release either very late, kind of as a surprise, or when there's no data to display. I just want to make sure that you have a better idea of what might be going on if you ever encounter this in one of your own burn down charts, just so you can better communicate what might be happening to the team. And so we have about 15 more minutes of actual content here. I might be close to finishing maybe a little bit earlier, but there's a couple other things I wanted to get to. So the dashboard is an excellent way of displaying, of telling the story of how your sprint or release is going. And you can use this for other use cases as well, as well that I'll mention in a moment. Um, but in this case, I've just corrected my my dashboard so that it displays the data I want to see. So it shows the velocity start date has been moved to yesterday, to Monday. I just logged a work log, and so I now have a projected ship date. My current velocity could use some work, but again, that was just my own work log. If I have maybe nine other team members start performing work logs on a regular basis, then I'll start getting a velocity that really, really shows the progress that we're making. 
And I have three supporting gadgets that accompany my burn down chart. So I have two item charts and I have one estimated versus actual. So this estimated versus actual is this gadget that you see in the middle. Um, and the user's workload and the work by priority are the two item charts that I referenced. The item chart is by far the most flexible gadget that you have in your dashboard. You can do so many things with it. And I prefer, I prefer to use uh, the item chart for um, pie charts, but I've seen it used for, you know, bar graphs, line graphs. I've seen it. I've seen excellent uses of it. Um, but to break down this user's workload um, gadget example here, so I have organized this data by the assigned to field. So it's looking at every single one of my team members and it says, okay, I'm going to look at all your team members, but what do you want me to see? What do you want me to look at in particular? So now you can also organize things based off of workflow step, based off of status, based off of priority. Um, but in this case, I've chosen assigned to. And of the assigned to, I want to see how much work is remaining for everyone in sprint three, which is the release I have selected by default. And so I'm using global dashboard settings here, by the way. That's why it's grayed out. Um, this option has already been updated for me. Uh, but if I wanted to, you know, go ahead and change that myself, I can just uncheck the use global dashboard settings and customize it myself. But that's what's happening there. And right now I have it set to all projects. I just want to see a general distribution because I might have items from all projects associated to Sprint 3A, right? So I want to provide that flexibility. And if I wanted to provide even more filtering options, I have... You can create your own filters that Axosoft will access from this drop-down menu. So I, maybe I only want to see things that are not closed. So that might make sense here. And I can also introduce um, date filters. So I only want to see items from certain time periods. So let's go ahead and check that out. And so here I have the distribution of all the items. So I see that Dennis has 51 hours of work remaining. I, he has the biggest piece. Uh, dev is the dev team. So you can assign items to a team. Um, as I mentioned in previous resources about the release planner, and I can get to more, I can answer more questions about that if there's any questions out there. Um, and then the other item chart does something, something very similar. It just organizes things by priority, but it also looks at the remaining estimate. But I can also get a count where I can look at different feature, uh, or different item types. And so you start to see how you can use this. I've seen folks build dashboards purely out of item charts. Um, the best use case I've seen is help desk. And so maybe you want to see the number of items that came in today and how they were assigned to everyone. Maybe you want to see that, but over the last seven days or over the last 30 days. That's something that we do here internally um, that just comes in handy just to see how is the ticket volume fluctuating, who's doing a lot of the work, or you know how is it being distributed. Um, and keep in mind, you can create as many dashboards as you'd like. If you want more information about that help desk use case, um, or just Help Desk in general. Um, we do have the Help Desk webinar already recorded and on our YouTube channel. We also have the Customer Portal webinar that talks about how you best practices surrounding the Customer Portal. Um, so that's all available on our YouTube channel, much like how this webinar will also be available on our YouTube channel. I love our YouTube channel, so I try to make the best of it. And uh, so I try to put as much good content on there for you guys as possible. Okay, and then two more major things here before I transition over to Q&A here. So the daily standup is one excellent way that you can track um, on a day-to-day -day basis of how are things going. And so let's go ahead and look at Sprint 3, which is the one we were just on. And so how did we design the standup to be um, optimized for projector? So to be in a conference room with your team members and to throw this up on a projector. So that's what we do here. So we go ahead, since we're all located here in one location, all our developers during their daily standup will pull this up on a projector and they'll go start the timer and answer those three questions that are common to you know the daily scrum, right? What did you do yesterday? Which is represented here under the work logged section. So they can go ahead and describe what they did. What's still on your plate, which is represented here by the assigned section. Um, and any notes that the user leaves here, this is from their scratch pad, right? And so you can pull up your scratch pad and you can flag one of your entries for the daily scrum. And those are notes to you, right? So when they pull this up on the projector, like, oh, okay, that's what I wanted to talk about today during just really quickly so we can go ahead and get another discussion started offline. 
The other use case that I've seen is that folks have used this over a WebEx or a GoToMeeting. Perhaps you have a distributed team and you just want to get, you just want something useful for that developer meeting, that stand up that you have over the internet. And so this would be a great way of just throwing this up on the screen share. You can just have one person share this and then start the timer and move from one person to one person on the call. So those have been two excellent uses of the daily standup. You can also just pull this up, you know, if you're a project manager and you just want to take take a look at how things are going, get a pulse check. You can definitely just use this to pull this up as a uh, quick visual of how things are going for each person. Um, we introduced, we have a lot of information on the daily standup on another one of our webinars as well. When we, I think it's one of the first ones we posted uh, last year is the 14.2 uh, release webinar, which dives into a lot of detail on the best way to use uh, the daily scrum as it was called back then and now it's now called the standup. But I just wanted to talk on some of the best ways that you can use the daily standup right now. And then the last thing I wanna to touch on is general reporting that is available in Axosoft. So let me jump over to um, just a general backlog. I'm going to get rid of the release, uh, the, the burn down charts. And so what is available to you in terms of just pumping out data that is stored in Axosoft? So if you're in the all items tab, or if you're using a super tab that is able to display all items, then you have access to this all items report. And so the all items report will look at all your, all your filters from that tab, and it will sort by... So in my case, I was grouped by workflow step, so it does that for me. And it totals everything per my grouping. So it's a really useful report because it just introduces these totals. Um, but there's other options available to you as well. Um, if you're a longtime Axosoft user, then a lot of these are just rearranged features that you're familiar with already. Um, so for example, if you go to any one item type, so in this case, I'm in incidents or tickets, um, and you access that drop-down menu again, you have um, can't reports based off of this item type. So tickets reported by month, by week, by day, um, and so on and so forth. If I wanted to get reports that are based off the project folder, so I have pure chat selected here. So underneath the organized panel, I'm going to navigate to the more menu, or it's right here, and I'm going to the report section. So you have access to the project workload, the project readiness, project summary, these are reports that are available to you as well. But by far, what I recommend the most is to just use the print functionality in general. So I'm gonna jump over to card view. I have things organized. I'm gonna organize it by sprint three. I only wanna look at items on sprint three. And I just wanna see the distribution here. And so if I were to hit the print button, it takes that exact view and it'll print it out in a PDF form, something that I can save to a PDF and send to someone. Right, and so it's just a great way to visualize of how things are going, preserves the color if you want. All of that is here. Um, so the print option will preserve your filters. It will preserve the whether or not you're in card view or list view, um, what workflow step columns, what workflow you're using. Um, if I'm in list view, it's going to preserve the column options I have enabled. So let's say I wanted to enable another column. I wanted to create it by. And so, and if I were to print this again, get rid of this other one. So there it is, created by. So all of that data is here and preserved. So you're only limited by the real estate of your printer paper if you wanted to print this into a hard copy. But if you wanted to send this electronically, then you, you of course, kind of start to see how much data you can really communicate to your team. So we have touched on lots of features here today. So I've touched on burn down best practices. I've touched on dashboard best practices. There is one more that comes to mind now that I think about it. The dashboard can be shared with non-Axosoft users. This is something I really do love sharing with customers, uh, just in terms of like the capability that is here. And so if you've already enabled it, then you have this link icon in the upper right corner that you can use to copy the dashboard. So it looks like I need to, um, looks like I need to go, if you, if, that, if you get that same message, you need to go to your dashboard settings, which is this gear in the upper left corner, and you need to go to create, you need to create a URL for public access. And so it's going to ask you, hey, make sure you have the API settings enabled as well. And then you can go ahead and just copy the, da the dashboard link and share it with someone via an email. You can enable a password if it's something sensitive that you want to protect. Um, but this is a great way of getting dashboard data 
over to non-access app users. So maybe these are executives, maybe these are stakeholders or managers, maybe these are customers. It kind of just depends on you know your environment, your organization, how you guys set yourself. So thank up. you everyone for taking the time out of your day to join us for this webinar. This concludes the Access Off Best Practices webinar for the release planner and burn down charts and of course some other bonus material. Thank you so much for your time and have a fantastic Tuesday. <laughs>